Hello, good afternoon. I'd like to introduce our Dane Protects webinar series. Today's session is on our expert applications for the IEC methods to protect solar field and photovoltaic plants. I'd like to introduce myself, Mark Hendricks with Dane Inc. and my illustrious colleague, Steve Weber. Hello everybody and welcome. Thanks, Stephen. Today we're talking about the application of protection measures for photovoltaic solar plant farm power generation facilities. The topics and the flow of the material is intended to cover risk, design, products, installation, quality control, to create a thorough protection for these very important applications. So I'd just like to take a moment to do a, a general look at photovoltaic solar farms. You have these large spanning collection of solar panels and intermixed with very key uh, inverter, converter assets. And this all links back to the uh, electric power grid. So we have a, a, a situation where you have these assets spread across these wide areas with a, essentially a large uh, potential for direct lightning strikes. But there's other sources of damage. You have indirect strikes, you're connected to the power grid, so you can have problems from grid switching. You have these exposed panels that could be subject to static buildup. And pr the protection measures that we that we cover, they're really intended to provide a very thorough control of the damage to these assets. So let's look at the, the damage. What, what can really happen to solar panels and, and the electric uh, systems associated with these? Well, of course, direct strike can cause fire, which would be extreme. You have damage into the converters, the inverters, the bypass diodes. This all poses extreme obvious damage, but but remember when when this damage occurs, it isn't always just what you see. There's a lot of hidden damage. The wiring systems can all be very highly stressed. Uh, you'll have you'll have what could be you know tens and hundreds of meters of electric control systems that will also have to be prepared, repaired. And it's not always obvious that some of this equipment experienced some of the traumatic damage. You've got Combiner box systems that have uh, in, in incredible amount of damage that can be incurred. Obviously, we've got uh, the, like I mentioned, the, the obvious visible stuff, but also the, the hidden damage and all the way back into the power voltage converters and even into the mechanisms that get it, the power back into the electric grid. Uh, these are just a few nice photographs showing the 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 amount of damage that can be incurred onto the smaller circuit boards. Of course, we showed the the photographs of the massive fire, but there's all sorts of smaller damage that can be occurred. The, it's not always just the big giant direct strike damage. So there's there's lots of other damage that that we have to protect against. That's very important to consider. As I mentioned, there's there's the stress that's incurred into the wiring cables. So you can easily see that a solar panel might have been damaged, but it's harder to trace back and find all of the other damage that can be incurred into a system. What's also very commonly misunderstood is that the communication systems, all of the data collection is also subject to damage. And it's very easy to miss that and have in, uh, put into place very effective measures, but then miss some of the, the smaller data collection. For instance, cameras. In this case, we're seeing uh, the coaxial cable damage on the CAN bus systems, damage into the ethernet and communications cards. There's all sorts of other equipment that are out at these solar fields, like the wind anorometers, and you'll see things that look like welded bolts and all sorts of other damage on these systems that's not obvious. 
And then, of course, there's the solar panel damage where you'll have uh, easily whole sections of solar panels with uh, broken glass. And finally, there's been a lot of discussions about other types of protection, non-conventional protection measures where the product is claimed to have a protective measure that's not actually demonstrated in the field. So in this case, this type of ESC, early streamer emission protection mast that is placed around a solar field with a large claim of protection. And what we have found, customers come back to us and they, and they show us that even though the diode bypass board might have been underneath the, the zone of protection, it's still subject to massive direct strike damage. So is it really a 102 meter protection radius? And does it really meet the claims? And that's why it's really important to stay with conventional, industry accepted and the industry standard approved protection me measures. So the IEC system starts with risk management. We need to evaluate and calculate what's the risk of damage. And because solar farms have a, a large span of lightning collection, it's, it's very easy to come to the conclusion that there's a high risk and that you have to apply immediate and, and incredible protection measures. But what we like to do with, with the, the IEC risk management system is select the necessary and sufficient measures and not go overboard. That's what's really important. So the, the IEC risk analysis will show you that there's a high likelihood of, of fire, which of course would lead to human life, loss of life. But there's really not a lot of people that are out on a day-to-day -day basis out in the middle of the solar farm. And if lightning storms are coming, we'll get a lightning stand down for the maintenance crews and they'll attend back to the control centers. But it's really important to evaluate that and, and pay attention and not go overboard, but also still apply necessary and sufficient measures. So in this slide, we show that if you do nothing to protect your solar farm, you'll have a very high risk. But if you apply a very high level of measure, such as an LPS class one, you can you can sort of go overboard and and essentially that translates to money. So if you apply a very high degree of protection, you would end up spending more money than you would, for instance, with an LPL class three, which is enough sufficient protection for your solar farm assets. So the operators must must really weigh that that uh, level of risk for the assets that might be out at the panel versus the assets that might be at the critical inverter converter and the power distribution uh, grid. So it's a really good opportunity for us to take a, a look at the and review the pillars of protection. They, so an, a, a properly designed lightning protection system will incorporate air termination systems, the down conductor system to get that energy directed to the earth, the earth termination system itself, which is critical for both lightning protection and electrical power safety. But at the same time, all of this has to be weighed with maintaining separation distance and lightning equipotential bonding. And so the, the, the term we like to use is bond that stuff, but not all the metal can and even should be bonded together. Some, some of that metal should be separate from the lightning protection system. And also we need to account for surge protection devices within that lightning protection equipotential bonding because you, you can't bond your electric DC power. You have to protect and control that voltage. And that's where it falls under that lightning equipotential bonding. So keeping this pillars of protection in mind, then we can start looking at lightning protection systems and have a much thorough understanding of what you need to do. So the IEC methods described in IEC 61643-32, they describe the basics of a lightning protection system. And this slide is really nice. It actually gives you a lot of information. You have two classes of, of types of systems where you're bonding the, the LPS system with your PV array, and you're essentially applying tips onto the electrical 
the the metal control panels, the, the metal holders that are that are holding the and and part of your PV panels. And then we have isolated systems where you're intentionally holding the lightning conductors, the down conductors, the air terminals away from the panels. And this is interesting because it gives you the indication of the SPDs that you need to apply to your electrical systems. So basically what we see is in a bonded system, you actually need to apply a lot more stringent SPD measures where you'll need to use the, the very high energy direct strike SPDs on your, your DC power system and your AC system. So what we see in these charts is really just a block diagram of the, the a typical solar farm. You have your PV array, you have your PV inverters where you're converting the electric energy to, to AC suitable to then link and load up to the grid. But in each of these areas, we see where the SPDs are required. And we see the types of SPDs that need to be applied. So if you have an isolated system as depicted on the right, you can use these types of standards as a guideline to what SPD you need to apply at those critical areas. And I like this type of diagram because it shows you all the methods that we've talked about in the pillars of protection. You have equipotential bonding, you have your earthing system, you have a, a, a clean single point of bonding where all of the systems come back to a dedicated bonding system, an earthing system. What I like to use is the term daisy chain, where I've, I've seen some customers mistakenly apply loops and daisy chains throughout a system where the, it's not a clean method of bonding. So that's what's nice about these diagrams. They give you a very good indication of a clean, well-designed system at a block diagram level. The NFPA 780 also offers some very clean guidance onto the bonding and current splitting of what you can expect. Now, NFPA pays a lot less attention to an isolated system, but it really does help us focus on the, the surge protection device placement. And one of the interesting things about the NFPA system is that it, it actually gives you some guidance as to what sorts of current that you can expect to see at your SPDs. And as we saw in the IEC methods, the SPDs that are down in this diagram, you can see they're located next to the power inverters. You can see that there's a lot of attention paid to the amount of current that might be flowing. And this is something similar to what we see in the IEC methods where we need to consider direct strike ground potential rise current that you're going to see in a strike event. So the lightning currents will flow into the earth and it's the earth rising that actually injects these currents back into the electric systems. So I also want to take a moment and, and review that step leader attachment method that we've talked about in the past. The, our, our best understanding of lightning propagation is the movement of charge through the atmosphere. And as that charge propagates, it's, it's jumping through the atmosphere and it sends out a step leader. It's that charge is provoking an electric field all throughout the region below it. And what we see is that everything below it within that sphere of the electric field is trying to, to talk to that electric charge. And you see what are called streamers that will be provoked from these, these objects below it. So remember, it's not just one lightning streamer. There's lots of, of all of the elements. And if you're standing out on the golf course during an, any sort of lightning storm and you feel that little bit of electric charge on the back of your neck, you're provoking a streamer to try to attach to. So that's just one sort of anecdotal evidence of what's really happening. So even though the lightning will eventually find and attach to that final step leader, that final striking distance, other pieces of equipment within that solar farm are all provoking a small step leader. So even if you don't get the direct strike, you're still subject to some uh, amount of electric charge that's being induced and could be also damaging your equipment. 
So the final striking distance is that final step leader. And what we have come to understand about lightning is that th that that distance, the radius that it can jump from the charge is related to the amount of current. And not all lightning is created equal. Some lightning has this wrath of God, high 200 kA or even higher amount of current that's that's being dumped from the atmosphere. But also there's small strikes. And the small strikes are actually even more dangerous because the small strike provokes a smaller striking distance. And that can allow that lightning attachment into all the little nooks and crannies around your solar farm. And so it's really important to understand the, the, the amount of risk that you're going to try to tolerate. So this is what that rolling sphere might look like out at the solar panels. And there's a lot of really good information to, to consider in this slide. You have the mast, and in this case, isolated from the solar panel, and you need to maintain the separation distance between the edge of the solar panel to the mast. The mast creates a, a point of attachment, and from that we can calculate the rolling sphere between the two masts. And what's important here is that you want to maintain the separation distance, but you always have to pay attention, and especially in solar farms, you have to pay attention to the shadow that you could be casting onto your solar panels. And we'll talk about that, but this is a really good illustration showing that you need to maintain certain angles and spacing around the solar farm, around the solar panels, to prevent lightning attachment, but also to prevent the shadow being cast directly onto those panels. So we're talking about this, this strike energy. Is, is it always a wrath of God strike? Well, there's lots of in, information available from areas like StrikeNet and Visala that can tell us the, the strike energy from the lightning storm that, that passes through an area. And in this case, we, we took a very careful look at a solar farm and we were able to see that the strikes that were hitting this solar farm were not all these wrath of God strikes. Some of them were well below the 16 kA, which is identified as an LPL4. And what's important here to know is that, the, remember, the smaller strike will have a smaller radius and can get into the nooks and crannies. And the strike severity is where we calculate our risk control. It, this basically comes out of the risk study. So if we decide that the risk at the solar plant is low, then we can apply what's considered a, a less stringent lightning protection level. But if we do that, we can also be opening up our solar field to a lot more strikes because we're applying less stringent measures. So it, it, it all goes back to the customer's tolerance for risk. So the less tolerant for risk would be a class one, and the more tolerant of risk would be a class four. But you're opening yourself up to a larger rolling sphere, which could still get in and damage your, elect, your electric solar panel collectors. And what we see is that some customers will actually create what looks like a hybrid system. And we'll talk about that, where part of their solar field, they'll allow to have a LPL rolling sphere of 60 meters. And the other parts of the rolling of the of the solar field where the very expensive inverters and converters and the and the substation attachment to the grid, they might have a smaller rolling sphere in order to provide more coverage. So now I want to talk more about the effects of shadow. And this is really important when we're designing the air termination system. So what's nice about a chart like this, we can see the definition of the penumbra and the umbra. And this is what creates the shadow. Much like the moon passing in front of the sun, we have an area where it's a complete eclipse onto the solar panel. And then you have an area where it's not a complete eclipse. And what's really important to avoid is that area that is a complete shadow, a dark shadow cast on the solar panel. So the, the, the 
real important aspect in a slide like this is to pay attention to your angle of incidence from the sun and to be able to calculate a distance to avoid a core direct full eclipse, a core shadow cast onto your solar panel. So not only do you have to space the air termination rod away from the panel to avoid side flash, but you have to keep that spacing and the angles suitable to prevent a core shadow. And what we see about core shadows is, is actually a little bit, uh, I'll say, a little bit uh, ironic is that a shadow actually creates a hot spot in the voltage stream. So on a solar panel, if you have a shadow cast directly onto that panel, a core full eclipse onto that panel, what will happen is that little area of the solar panel will actually struggle to maintain its voltage and will and then become a hot spot and actually over time will become a, a, a very key area where it fails. And if that part of the panel fails, then the entire string starts struggling. And this is where we, we will benefit by having things like smart inverters and smart converters that are, that are actually monitoring if you have a, a portion of your solar panel that's struggling. And so what we see in a, in a slide like this is you have your air terminal and it's at an angle such that it will avoid casting a, a full eclipsing core shadow onto the panel, but still provide the coverage, the rolling sphere attachment point in order to properly protect that area of the solar farm. So air terminal configurations, we have a couple of options. We can apply direct bonding to the frame like we saw in the previous photograph where the actual air terminal is bonded directly into the struts. Now, this is quite uh, attractive because you can then have, you know, very clean direct strike protection of these panels. But now you've introduced the lightning currents directly into the frames and you have to pay more attention to the SPDs that you apply. And you have to be very careful about your bonding and your earthing of these electric and uh, solar panels. Then we have options for masts that are separate and isolated from the solar panels. And this is attractive because now you're not bonding directly to it and you can, uh, you can direct your direct strike energy well away from the solar panel. Now that doesn't mean that the solar panel frames don't need to be bonded and earthed. It means that you're isolating the lightning currents away from those panels. And in our bottom image, we show a, a isolated system with very tall mass. And in every case, what we're trying to make sure we're doing is providing a rolling sphere system that will, that will attach the, the lightning strike to the mass without inducing it directly into the panels. And that's what some of these, these uh, slides next will show us is the rolling sphere is actually able to, the, the calculations will show us that the rolling sphere will attach to the points and not the panels. And that's what's nice because the features and benefits then you can, you can have a easy to install air terminal with very diffuse shadows, but then you have to pay more attention to your SPD applications. When you look at a system like this, you can see that the air terminals are attached to the frame. The frame is bonded to the soil. The soil is then uh, where your lightning currents are dissipated. But it's very important to pay attention to all that bonding and these connections. They all have to meet the, the rigorous requirements for the purpose of attaching electric uh, direct strike lightning energy into the soil. Here we have some images of the rolling sphere calculated with a taller mast. And what's nice about this is that with just a few taller masts, you can accomplish a very effective coverage over the entire solar field out at this type of a plant. And with just a few very strategically well-placed air terminals, you can get your coverage model. and 
when they're properly spaced, you can avoid that core shadow, that complete eclipse. Now you can see a tall mast might cast shadows over the a larger area, but they won't be a direct core shadow if you maintain your spacing correctly. So here we have some taller mass with excellent coverage with less chance of damage to the SPDs and into the electric and DC power systems. So that's what's important about, about the different types of air termination systems. And this slide is nice because you can see that the, the shadows, the effect of these core shadows and the effect of the diffuse shadows in the different types of, of systems at different times of the day. And this is what's really nice about using the IEC methods is that you can do a very thorough analysis. You can calculate and demonstrate to your customer what is the expected effect and where will you see core shadows and will they actually be a complete eclipse or is it just a diffuse shadow across these panels? And that's what's really important is to pay pay attention to the pillars of lightning protection, but also watch out where your shadows are going to fall. So what we see a lot of customers, uh, they they want to protect their their direct photovoltaic panels because these are obviously these are expensive equipment and they're attached to the string inverters and central inverters. So you might not just lose a panel, you'll lose an entire string of panels, you'll lose an entire string of inverters. If you get strike into this panel, it can damage it in hundreds of meters of, of wiring as well that you wouldn't necessarily see, then you'll have to you know, really pay a lot of attention to the repairs. But we'll, we'll see customers with a hybrid system where they have small terminals on the panels and then a larger isolated system at the very critical expensive inverter converter and battery systems out at a plant and this is very attractive to customers because it allows them to use the iec methods and the risk analysis tool to tell them i have a low risk at the panel but i have a higher risk at the inverter let me apply a customized set of measures and it lets them mix and match the lightning protection and the SPD applications to meet the risk for that different type of equipment out in the solar farm. So earthing and bonding is always an, a, a very important uh, aspect of the system. A solar farm is essentially a big grid out on the soil. And you'll you'll see what essentially looks like a collection of earth rings. And as we have looked at in the past, we use the IEC risk analysis to tell us what class of protection. And the class of protection guides us in the design of the earth grid. So if we know our soil resistivity, we can then apply suitable earth ring measures to meet the class of protection and to, to have a, a very effective grid for the earth system. And here we have a couple of photographs showing us what are the critical aspects of the connections, what are the critical connection measures you need to apply. We can also use these measures to estimate what's going to happen if we get a direct strike. We can look at that current sharing. We can look at the effect of the grid. So in a diagram like this, we see the earthing grid, and we also see essentially the, the string inverters, bringing that electric energy back to the converter and your central inverters, and then ultimately back to the power grid. So in a diagram such as this, you're seeing your green earthing grid overlaid with your red DC power uh, strings to bring it all back to the a central inverter converter. And then, in a larger diagram, you can see that this is really just part of what's essentially a much larger solar field. So this can lead us to simulations where we can estimate what's going to happen if the lightning energy hits the panel. So we can, we can inject the lightning currents simulated into the circuit, and then we can 
estimate and calculate through simulation what sorts of currents you can expect. And this tells us what we should apply for the SPD measures. And here you can see that with the direct strike energy simulated, you can, you can simulate what the currents are going to do and we can estimate with, with the tool like this what the SPD currents should look like. And when we map this all out, what we see is that in a well-designed system, it's what we would expect, that the, the currents are mostly flowing into the earth with some of the currents into the DC circuits and then through the SPD. And in this case, it's what we would expect is that a high percentage of the current is directed into the earth and a much lower percent of current is then expected to flow into the SPD. And this is very helpful for, again, for designing a proper system and then ultimately putting your SPDs where they belong. So the standards are very helpful because they tell us how to space and where to put the, the mesh systems for your earthing. And, you know, generally speaking, what you'll see is that it looks like a 20 by 20 or even a 40 by 40 meter mesh applied across the solar field. And remember, this is all based on the cost of the, the installation. So what's important is to design an earth mesh that's effective, but not overkill. It's very easy to go over the top and have a very expensive earth grid that really don't, that really won't give you as all the protection. And it might actually be over the top. And we want to be effective, but we don't want to go overboard. So in the methods that we apply, it's always very helpful and uh, important to come back and inspect these earthing grids. So what you can see in a slide like this is that we have the ability to measure the, the loop attachment of the pigtail to the solar farm uh, mechanisms, but we can also find the uh, a reading that might be orders of magnitude higher. So if you have attachments in your grid that are in the, the 0.02 and the 0 .09, uh, 0 0.029 range, and then you see another attachment loop that's up in the high range of even 19 ohms, you know that that is an indication that something is misapplied or misconnected probably a, a problem in the buried pigtail connection. So this is part of the methods that we apply to, to really make sure that the, the earthing grid was actually installed correctly. So the final part of the pillars of protection would involve surge protection applications. And this is just a snapshot of what a large solar farm might look like. But what's nice about this slide is you see all of the aspects. You have the solar panel collection systems that lead from the DC to the AC and converter inverters. Then this energy is then uh, transformed into the main grid. And by properly reviewing the schematic of the solar farm, you can find all of the critical areas where you're going to want to apply SPDs. And what's important is to not leave a back door back to your control system. So in this case, we can see the Dane red SPDs on the DC and AC power, but also by, an, by analyzing this, you can see our yellow data line protectors. And it's not completely obvious, but all of these yellow data line protectors are protecting critical aspects of your control, communication, security camera systems. It's not just enough to protect the AC and the DC power lines. You have to protect your critical communication and data collection lines. So with a properly designed system and proper emphasis on the entire control system, you can be sure to avoid the backdoor damage, which can be just as damaging as a direct strike onto the panel or in, in blowing apart a string. If you lose your data collection system, you have just as much uh, probability that your entire 
solar farm is going to be offline. So we also take a very close look at the control rooms in the at a solar farm where you've got your critical applications, security cameras, measurement control systems. So this is obviously where the people are. So in a solar farm, you're, it's important to be protecting the critical assets, but it's always about fire prevention and human safety is the critical, critical point that we're trying to protect. So this is where that hybrid system might also come into effect, where you might have a, a more tolerance for risk out at the actual solar panels, but a obviously a very less tolerance for risk at the control centers where the human operators and maintenance systems are. So this is a really good slide to talk about a bonded external lightning protection system and what to pay attention to. So here we looked at the air terminals of a bonded system and you can clearly see it's bonded to the electric frame, to the, to the mechanical aluminum framework. But when we do a bonded system, we have to pay even more attention to the surge protection. And here we see the application of SPDs at the, the actual string inverters, out at the central inverters, back at the, at the, uh, the control system. We see the application of data protection SPDs out on the strings that are monitoring the performance of the inverters. And then we see the application of SPDs back at the central inverter. And we've talked about this where the SPDs are applied at both ends of a system. And we had some questions in one of our previous webinars. How, how far apart do you have to, uh, would, would you actually pay attention before you need to put more SPDs in? And what we see in the IEC standards, it's generally about 10 meters. So anything that's out in the, the large scale solar farm, you're going to obviously be well away from the, the systems and you want to maintain protection at both ends. But that's for the IO control systems, the, for instance, your cameras and your data collection, as well as the power systems. Here we have a, a really nice indication of what would be an isolated external lightning protection system. And this shows you all of the same sorts of attributes. The, the pillars of protection are still maintained. You have the air termination, you have your down conductor systems, you have earthing and bonding, and you have the application of SPDs. And in this case, we have separation distance for it to, for it to be an isolated system. And this might look like a system where they are held off with fiberglass holders, or it might be a system with, where the masts are taller mass separated from the panels. We're paying attention to the shadows that are being cast while also maintaining a, a, an effective coverage over the solar panels. And we see the same application of SPDs. In this case, we can uh, apply our type two SPDs because we don't have as much current directly injected into the into the panels, into the frameworks. But again, you're protecting both ends. You've got the SPDs out in the, the actually distributed amongst the solar panels, and we actually have SPDs installed inside of the control hut where the central inverter and control systems are. And again, you, you have all of the pillars of protection being maintained in a thorough application. So I'd like to take a moment just to talk about what SPDs, the features and benefits of SPDs and what they're trying to do. Your, the SPD is there to control the voltage across two wires. And Dane has a very comprehensive family of SPDs. In this illustration, we're showing a blitz ductor type device, which is excellent for data line and low voltage control IO circuits. And what's important about this image is that you see that you have an extremely effective voltage switching element like a spark gap device, but it's coupled with extremely effective low voltage control elements like silicon avalanche diodes. And so what this shows us is that the more exposed side of a system can be protected with the voltage switching elements and the very 
sensitive side of the system that might be connected directly into your I.O. control panels is protected at the the by the silicon avalanche diodes. And here we see there's a series element that allows these two types of devices to do their function effectively and essentially decouple them from each other. Otherwise, they're, they're not really working as well together. So Dane has taken a lot of effort to make sure that our types of devices do the, the best possible protection. And a unique function that Dane offers is to allow the circuit to be checked. In other words, what we're doing is we're monitoring the effectiveness and the life of the SPD before it fails. And this is really a unique feature that we have because what it's doing is it's it's allowing the data to flow correctly, but otherwise we're monitoring the SPD. And this is just something that we can uh, offer our clients that give them the ability to, to maintain maintenance with no impact to the actual data in the circuit. So the SPD applications around the actual PV panels, you see it's, again, it's back to, uh, you want to protect at the point of use of the panel, but you also want to protect back at the, the converter and the inverter panels inside of your control systems. And so this is an application where you'll see the SPD mounted directly on the panels, directly next to the string inverters, and then back at the main panel in the control panels within the structure. And you have some really good examples of the data lines being protected, as well as the low voltage IO control lines, things like the cameras and the other uh, power over ethernet devices out at a plant. CAN bus protection, both ends, out at the equipment, out at the, the critical string inverter and back at the marshalling cabinet. And as I mentioned before, there's some really good references within IEC, IEC 61643, 62305. They mention that you want to pay attention to not more than 10 meters before you apply your SPD. So if, if the panel is immediately adjacent to, this, to the victim, you might get away with one SPD. But when they're spread apart, more than 10 meters, you really want to make sure that you're applying surge protection devices on both ends. And as we mentioned, if it's if it's out at the uh, an exposed, highly exposed area, that's where you want to make sure that you're applying the most rigorous types of SPDs. We noticed in in our early slide in a bonded lightning protection system, you're going to want to pay attention and use critical type one SPDs, which are able to handle that direct lightning strike energy. And then what we see a lot of customers want is, is also to use type two surge protection and that in order to get the maximum amount of protection at their equipment. Grounding, bonding, and protection, they all go together. So always pay attention to the bonding methods within your cabinet. In this couple of photographs, we can see that the control panels are protected, they're bonded. You have the, the the actual door of a type of a panel like this, all protected. You don't want floating metal. Floating metal invites voltage differences, and voltage differences will cause the, the, the equipment to fail. You'll have more chance of injecting spikes if you have voltage differences, and that's what equipotential bonding is. It's creating equal potentials so that if there is a strike, Everything rises, everything falls together like a bird on a wire. And another illustration showing us the power over ethernet protection. You have a asset like a solar farm where you have cameras distributed throughout the, the facility. You have in, important power over ethernet assets all throughout the, the solar farm. And you wanna make sure that though that equipment is protected at the camera and back at the router and the switches. Again, protection at both ends, anything more than 10 meters apart, especially the outdoor data collection and camera equipment that connects back to your indoor systems. CAN bus protection at the point where the inverters and converters are, you wanna make sure that you're paying attention to uh, the point of use and back at the main panel. Air terminals, earthing and bonding, and SPD applications. 
the pillars of protection. And that's what, a, what we see in some of our photographs here where Dane has helped our customers with the air terminal placement, with clever designs to avoid shadows being cast on the panels, but still provide suitable air terminal placement. We see a lot of attention get paid to the, the bonding straps that are around these types of very important uh, mechanisms that keep the solar panel at maximum efficiency, pointed directly at the, at the sun to, to maximize solar collection. But at the same time, you have to pay a lot of attention to the bonding around those mechanisms to prevent the mechanism itself from being destroyed. There's a lot of attention paid to bonding and, and earthing the actual support struts into the soil so that the earthing system is as effective as possible. We have point of use SPDs at the string inverters and then SPDs applied at the central inverter. So in summary of the solar field project, we want to calculate, design, install, and inspect. Our methods are very effective at providing a suitable protection for the customer, but we also want to assure the customer that it's all been inspected and installed correctly. We want to certify the application and then provide the customer with the long-term benefit of, these, of this expense. So it's not just to install and forget. We, the, our equipment is very effective, but we also want to show our customer that it has, uh, that they have a, a long-term protection. We're in business for the last 110 years. We're going to stay in business. We want to show our customer that our maintenance plan will give them the full long-term investment. And in a sketch like this, we can see all of the aspects that we've been talking about. You have your earthing and bonding, you have your, your, your solar farms, you have your battery storage systems, you have camera systems that are all part of a, of a holistic approach to lightning protection. Our methods include uh, a, a comprehensive project management and project quality control, where we're offering our customer the opportunity to have inspections throughout the system so that we're constantly monitoring the progress flow and then monitoring the finished result that the air terminals are properly installed, they're properly connected to earth, and that the lightning protection system met the intent of the design. And then finally, we do final certification and compliance, what we call our turnover book. Our customers, are uh, they, they love this because it shows them that the, the complete system was installed to meet their intent and that we have accomplished everything we've set out to do throughout the project. So in summary, here's what we covered today. Uh, from risk all the way through to the end of the, the turnover and into the final, you know, long-term maintenance of a system. So these are the intent of our uh, coverage today. Uh, I'd like to see if there's any questions from the audience today. Appreciate everybody's attention. Uh, Stephen, do we have any key questions? Yes, Mark. Uh, we received a question, uh, actually a number of a number of questions, specifically about the lightning risk assessment for a solar farm. Um, mm. If you will give me the opportunity, I just want to say a, a yes. few things about uh, conducting these type of risk assessment. The risk assessment process, um, as it is defined in the IEC 6305 standard, is not really applicable to massive big solar PV farms. We know from the risk analysis process type of factors that needs to be calculated. One being the amount of dangerous events that we can expect into the structure or into the solar field um, and that's linked to the structure and the geo geographic location and the flash densities and those type of things. The second factor is the probability that the damage can occur and then lastly um, if, these, uh, dam if these damages occur what is the associated loss factors. So for a big PV field, um, the only thing that we can calculate for the entire structure would be the amount of dangerous events that that massive PV field can see based on its dimensions and its location in the world. That's how we can calculate the amount of dangerous events. But now dependent on 
the solar PV arrays or the inverter, um, there's different cost factors, different economic loss factors that we need to take into consideration when calculating um, the effective protection methods. So what we will do then is look at the PV arrays and define what would be the probability of damage that these PV arrays would receive and what is the associated econ economic loss, not just for the replacement parts, but also for um, loss of production of the PV field. And then we'll do the same exercise focusing only on the inverters because these two different um, equipment on a PV field have different, big different uh, 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 cost factors that need to be considered. So then we will come to a solution where we, where we um, define, like I say, two different lighting protection zones. And then we'll come to a, a, a result in the risk analysis where we can say, uh, the PV fields, have the, they have the highest risk of being directly struck by lightning because of the highest footprint. But associate, the associated loss, uh, loss is not um, that critical as we do have spare PV panels or uh, we can uh, undergo a certain amount of loss and take it from there. But And then we'll come to the same conclusion for the inverters. We will say um, the risk for these inverters to, con to receive loss is so high and um, that's how we'll, and that's basically how we address a risk analysis for a PV field. And then the second question we have, Mark, uh, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Mark? Well, I think that speaks a lot to the ability to do, to both uh, do the risk analysis, sort of a hybrid risk analysis, and that allows you to do sort of a hybrid protection measures out in the, at the plant. But that's a, that's a great breakdown. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, and then the second okay. question we have is, um, uh, in a completed PV plant, there are, of course, multiple earth electrodes that are all connected together to form one big electrode. Um, when we look at the IEC requirements, we read up of the recommendation of 10 ohms for the earth electrode. Uh, do we consider this for the individual earth electrodes or for the combined? Um, I can just mention um, from my side, Mark, that um, when we read the IEC standard and it talks of the recommendation of 10 ohms, we should remember that the IEC also recommends a single integrated earth electrode system. So we can have an earth electrode system for, a, for any structure that consists of vertical and radial and ring conductors and we connect it together to form a single integrated earth electrode and then we measure that complete earth electrode system to be 10 ohms. So in an application of the PV field, um, the measurement of the 10 ohms is really applicable to the fully integrated earth electrode system consisting of the connections of earth electrodes. Anything yeah, to add, the, Mark? It's, that's, that's essentially what the, the National Electric Code and the other standards imply as well, is that uh, the, it's the final, the completed interconnected value. And any given earth rod might be much higher impedance but when you connect them all together you get your finished estimated value and it's usually a calculated value too i might add it's it's very difficult to establish what the final earth electrode measures as because it's all sort of confounded together but that's a, a great interpretation of it okay um we, we have a couple of uh, questions really asking then um, what would we recommend, um, an isolated lighting protection system or bonded lighting protection system? And uh, um, again, Mark, if you'll allow me. Um, yeah, please. We would always recommend the method that would be applicable to prevent the most, oh yes, to prevent and reduce the most uh, loss that any structure or PV field can have. So. Um, when we're designing systems, it's always first class to try and keep lightning current isolated and separate separate from the structure itself. But obviously, in certain applications, that's not really uh, acceptable or certain applications aren't really achievable. So um, then we'll have to go for bonded systems. And that's why the standards and the way then designs, we always address both isolated and bonded systems because of that uh, variance that we have to uh, take into consideration. Anything to add, Mark? Yeah, we, we have customers that, that do exactly that. They, they have less risk aversion. They're, they're very concerned about the, 
the control centers and where their operators sit, and they're not as concerned about the actual PV panels. So it'll it's it's really about what's the customer ultimately want to to uh, what's their level of tolerance. Okay. Um, but I like I think, to, I, I do agree. It's it's always best to isolate and and keep the lightning currents away from your asset in the first place. Yes. Um, we did okay. not really mention uh, battery backup systems in this presentation. I see we have a couple of questions asking about battery systems. Uh, um, I will. I can send it, um, out. Or I will send out a white paper that also addresses battery systems. But when we look at uh, battery systems uh, installed for these PV fields, the basic principles of protecting a PV field is also applicable to these battery backup systems. So you have to have an integrated earthing system connected to this to the integrated with the pv earthing system and um, surge protection device um, you know devices and measures as great as mark basically um, um, mentioned in the pv uh, in the pv presentation anything to add on protection of battery systems mark yeah there's the, it's the battery systems generally tend to be uh, uh, quite dangerous areas it, it actually they can be explosive environments as well so it's it's uh back to your uh, the comments about the control of risk so uh, as you mentioned there's we've got some really great white papers on the on the topic it's the battery system the battery backup system will be integrated with the entire dc you know power system itself so it's all the measures have to be considered together back to that holistic approach so of course we don't want to disregard protection of the battery systems at all yes yes so when you okay. uh, when you define a surge protection concept you'll include the requirements for those type of systems as well um, absolutely yeah and then another thing that we need to consider is um, when you're installing like mark showed these three different um, lighting protection concepts where we're bonding to the frame or we're installing lighting freestanding masts and also another thing to consider is the maintenance aspects that needs to be done at these pv fields like the cleaning of the pv panels and those things so um we have a question about this and what we do is when we do, when we do the design we do consider these maintenance um mm. activities at the pv fields and we will design a system that address addresses the best way to protect and still provide the necessary protection. Even even looking at the different PV technology, if you have a, a tracking system where the panels uh, change angles, we'll also write up a, 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 a procedure that the angle of the, what, what the angle of the solar arrays should be uh, to provide the most protection over all of the equipment so we'll address all these operational and maintenance aspects when we do design a solar field design yeah and absolutely mark, and that mark concludes our questions we have a, we have a few questions but unfortunately our time is up so i'd like to ask i'd like to say thank you to everybody that joined us for this webinar and thank yeah. you for this exceptionally well presented uh, presentation thank you mark thank you everybody and look forward to our next uh, webinar invitation all right. And uh, be safe out there. Have a great day.